So I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Gregory Hayworth is an associate professor of English and Digital Humanities at the University of Mississippi. After taking a BA in English from Cambridge and a PhD from Princeton in Comparative Literature, Gregory Hayworth began his career as a medievalist with a specialty in textual <laughs> studies um, and classical influence. In 2010, Hayworth founded and now directs the Lazarus Project, a nonprofit initiative to contribute to scholarship and to recover damaged cultural heritage objects around the world using various imaging technologies. And you can see the imaging set up uh, for the Lazarus Project at the reception later. Is that correct? Um, Give or take? Not the actual, uh, not the actual, I'll be showing some of the setup here. Okay. Not the actual book. No. Okay, my apologies. Um, so behind the Lazarus Project is also a curriculum in textual science that Hayward developed to train students in a combination of the history of the book, codicology, spectral imaging, imaging science, and digital display. Please help me welcome Gregory Hayward. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you today uh, about a topic which is, uh, I think, sadly timely. Considering what's going on in, in Syria now, the, the great challenges uh, uh, to cultural heritage objects uh, in Palmyra, Dura Europis, uh, we're all acutely aware of the urgency uh, with, uh, uh, with which we need to learn to, uh, to develop our technologies and, uh, and uh, also uh, to teach people how to uh, do the kinds of projects which perhaps ha stand a chance of rescuing some of these, uh, some of these uh, objects which are you know, perishing right before our very eyes. Um, uh, for me, uh, I'm interested uh, mostly in uh, manuscripts uh, rather than uh, some of the large-scale uh, uh, architectural or archaeological objects. Uh, and the, the story of damage, uh, some of the most painful stories of damage for me, begin in Tim Timbuktu in <coughs> January 16th, uh, 2013. Uh, a band of Al-Qaeda militants entered the, the city, ancient city of Timbuktu, which is on the southern edge of the Sahara Desert. And there, they set fire to a library of 30,000 manuscripts, medieval manuscripts, uh, ranging between, in subject between uh, uh, geography, uh, history, uh, medicine, and theology. In fact, uh, one manuscript contained what, perhaps the first cure for uh, male uh, erectile dysfunction. <laughs> uh, and uh, these manuscripts, they then, uh, they then burnt. In fact, at the time, the, the mayor of Timbuktu at the time called this uh, atrocity uh, perhaps one of the greatest losses to cultural heritage uh, ever. And he would have been right were not for the fact that he was also lying. In fact, a few hours before the, the militants arrived, uh, scholars very cleverly had uh, gathered an odd assortment of old books and left them out for the uh, militants to burn. Of course, being illiterate, they just did. Uh, the manuscripts were then secreted away and taken from their, their dry refuge in, uh, uh, in Timbuktu down to Mali, uh, down to Bamako in Mali, which now is no longer safe itself, as, as we all know. Uh, and there they have been moldering uh, these great objects which represent uh, the African voice of, of culture at a time when it was thought not to have a voice at all. Uh, this for me, uh, is one of the best examples of, of, of the urgency uh, of our field as it's, uh, as it's developing and, and, and moving toward the humanities. Uh, there's, a, there's a distant embrace uh, that's happening now, and I hope to uh, argue that it needs to be closer. Uh, objects such as the Timbuktu collection are not the only places, you know, these, these distant uh, realms are not the only places where manuscripts are, are in danger. In fact, uh, many of them are in danger much closer to home. Uh, several years ago, I conducted some research among uh, research libraries in Europe <coughs> and found that uh, at the very minimum, there are approximately 60,000 manuscripts which are damaged in, in ways that we can treat, that is, uh, charring, um, uh, mold, uh, fading, water damage. About 60,000 of these pre-1500. Uh, and that's not even counting uh, in Renaissance and, and modern, modern manuscripts. The real number is probably double that. And this is only Europe alone. Uh, so uh, what I want people to imagine is uh, a, a world in which a trove of, uh, of 
of objects, of manuscripts, covering the entire range of humanities and sciences as well, is available but uh, is rapidly uh, being lost. And what we're looking for, and we now have, are technologies that stand a chance at recovering them. Uh, and imagine how transformative uh, this a trove of hundreds of thousands of objects would be to, uh, to uh, uh, our knowledge of almost every discipline. And it would be transformative, and not transformative not of in, in, as, in as much as it uh, changes the canon, as we know it, of literature or history or art or mathematics or philosophy. Uh, but it would be able to bridge gaps, cultural gaps between peoples and cultures. Uh, and uh, this opportunity is something that uh, has compelled me, in fact, to a, a kind of change in my career. Uh, as a medievalist, I had been uh, someone who would uh, teach texts at a, at a distance. Uh, as a textual studies, someone involved in textual editing, I became more involved with the actual, uh, actual uh, editing of texts. And, and, uh, and further still, I realized the need, uh, therefore, to, to become involved in editing of manuscripts which were illegible and thought lost. And that's kind of how I started in this area. My story begins about, oh, about uh, seven, eight, nine years ago. Uh, and I was working on a, uh, uh, a unicum, a unique manuscript, uh, the, the most important, I think, uh, the most important uh, long poem of the European Middle Ages never to have been edited before. And it had never been edited before. It's called the uh, Eche d'Amour. And it had never been edited before because uh, it had been uh, badly damaged in the firebombing of Dresden uh, and was pr pronounced lost by generations of, of scholars. Oh, I should have shown uh, some, some images of the burning of the Malian uh, manuscripts. Uh, and this, of course, is the, this is, of course, what Dresden looked like. The manuscript itself uh, it was not really touched by fire as much as by, uh, as by uh, water uh, and mold. Uh, which ate through it and turned it into this uh, terrible mess. Uh, I'd worked on it for five years with ultraviolet lamps, and, and many of you uh, probably have used these before. And, and that can get you, that, that, that technology can get you just about, you know, up to a certain level, but no further. Uh, and I realized that I need to do something more, and so I did what many people do, and I went online. Uh, and I uh, learned about multispectral imaging uh, and what a group had been doing for the famous uh, Archimedes Palimpsest, which I'm sure you all know about. Uh, and I contacted Roger Easton uh, of the uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, actually Elizabeth's uh, colleague. And uh, he and I, he and I uh, developed a plan to build a transportable multispectral imaging system. Uh, and with it, we were able to image uh, this, and we got federal funding for this. And with it, we were able to image uh, in situ uh, the manuscript, and we were able to turn that, I was able to turn that into a, uh, a, a modern medieval classic. Uh, and it, uh, I took students along on that, and I realized at that moment that, that uh, student involvement, it, wasn't, it was more than just a research project. The real, uh, the real emphasis, I think, needs to be on integrating the research and technology into a, a, a curriculum, but more on that later. Uh, well, how does multispectral imaging uh, work? <clears throat> Anyone who's familiar with uh, uh, infrared goggles will know that uh, the, the spectrum of light and what we can see is only a, a tiny bit of what's actually there. Uh, we can, uh, multispectral imaging uh, is uh, about taking photographs, very, very high-end photographs, using, uh, in, in my case, a set of uh, LED lights, uh, which have uh, uh, 12 bands or 12 spectra between the ultraviolet and the infrared, so between about 350 nanometers and about 940. Uh, and these are set up uh, in... Uh, banks of lights, I have, uh, several banks of lights, and we're seeing, whoops, yeah, we can see uh, a kind of animation here of it. Uh, several banks of lights which shine down uh, on the manuscript from above, and then another, which you can't see in these images, which uh, is a transmissive light source which shines up through individual leaves of the manuscript from below. Uh, and these, uh, and we, we shoot not only in 12 bands, but we also have a filter wheel which separates fluorescence from, uh, from um, uh, reflection. So we actually shoot sometimes between uh, up to maybe 32 individual uh, shots per, uh, per folio or per, per side. Uh, and uh, once we've done that, we, uh, we use uh, 
and that's, you know, uh, image acquisition is extremely important, but then the image processing in itself is transformative or can be transformative. <clears throat> uh, we use uh, a, a, a various, various softwares you can use. We uh, usually use Envy, which is a, a high-end imaging software, which allows you to use, uh, uh, allows you to uh, take these images and, and process them uh, through s uh, statistical algorithms. Uh, independent component analysis, uh, principal component analysis, and a variety of other techniques, uh, which basically filters out noise uh, and enhances contrast. Uh, and uh, uh, we are able to do that. In, in, in doing that, we create, uh, often we're able to create uh, some really transformative images of objects uh, which uh, bring, out, uh, bring out text where none has been seen before. I have uh, some images. Now, th this we use not only for uh, manuscripts. We also use this for uh, maps and 3D objects as well. Uh, here you're looking at uh, our setup for, uh, for the Martellus map, a 1491 Martellus map uh, held by Beinecke Library. Uh, this is a map that uh, Columbus uh, apparently consulted before coming to the New World and which uh, fundamentally shaped his notion of where J Japan is there. You can see it in, in the upper right-hand corner, what it looked like, uh, and also uh, the shape of uh, Asia uh, as well as a variety of other details. Uh, and this map, uh, uh, we needed to use not just multispectral imaging, but we used a, a variety of other technologies, which are state-of-the-art technologies. I should say, as an aside, uh, multispectral imaging is something that, that uh, people may be familiar with as a term. Uh, the particular state-of-the-art in it, however, uh, involves LED technology. It involves uh, also a particular kind of lens, a quartz lens, which is <clears throat> transparent to ultraviolet. Uh, and uh, the ability to separate fluorescence from, uh, from reflected uh, uh, information, hugely important. But then uh, a variety of other techniques. You'll see in the upper right-hand corner, we have this, these, these lasers, which enable us uh, to aim the, the ca camera very, very, very accurately. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, as you, as you uh, shoot some object which has uh, cockles in it, you want to have very, very accurate uh, um, uh, focus on it, and those lasers enable us to do this. Some of the, some of the techniques that we developed. Um, uh, this object, which you can see outside, you'll be able to see both the Martellus uh, and this uh, object, which is the 1507 Lenox Globe held by uh, the New York Public Library, one of the earliest, earliest globes in the world. It's about the size of an ostrich egg. In fact, um, we're about to image uh, its companion in Krakow, uh, which is actually an ostrich egg. Uh, and uh, you can't quite see it here, but we have another rig uh, here which comes from the side. We can move the rig up and, and around the object while we uh, move it in. And the object is being rotated on the turntable uh, 360 degrees. Uh, and what you can see outside is a 3D uh, rendering that we, uh, we've made using structure from motion technology. Hasn't been done much before, but basically involves turning a 2D image, uh, which here because it was so shiny, we had to image at an extremely high uh, uh, pixel rate, so uh, 4,500 PPI, DPI, if you, if you have a sense of that, it's large. And we stitch it together, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, we are able to turn that 2D image into a 3D image, uh, it, much more accurately than laser scanning. So you'll see, uh, you'll see that, uh, or a version of that, uh, outside. But in order to do that, we're kind of coming up with ways uh, and technologies of just uh, to do that, and uh, kind of moving up and around. <clears throat> um, oh, let's go back for a second. This is, uh, I wanted to show you some eye candy of some of the, some of the uh, effects of multispectral imaging. This is the, the palm scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls imaged by my colleague uh, on the Lazarus Project, Ken Boyson, uh, a few years ago. It's now, some of these images are now up on Google. Uh, and what you're seeing here is a, a, a stitch image of, uh, of one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, the, uh, the damage at the bottom, of course, is... Uh, the, the, the leather, and this is, by the way, written on leather, not on, on parchment, it's uh, starting to, uh, to turn into cartilage. Uh, and all the writing has been, has been uh, and on the bottom, had been uh, very badly damaged. And in the IR, this all comes out. It's uh, carbon ink. Uh, uh, the challenges of some other kinds of uh, manuscripts, however, is greater. Uh, and one of them, uh, I'm, uh, let's see, let's move on to the next. Yes, we're happy here. Yeah, there we are. Very pretty. Um, uh, the next image I'm going to show you is of uh, the Codex Recalensis. 
this is the oldest translation of the Gospels into Latin. It dates uh, from, uh, I suspect, uh, uh, about the first half of the fourth century, somewhere between. Well, th this is this is this is the the, the oldest. Uh, this is the closest that we can come to what the Bible looked like at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, hugely valuable. Uh, it's unique, and as you can tell, uh, absolutely legible. Uh, and here we used a, a combination of both multispectral and uh, uh, XRF, X-ray fluorescence. Uh, but what the images that you're going to see are simply purely multispectral. Um, whoops. So we need to start the image. No, we don't want that. There we go. Uh, the splotch that you see in the upper left-hand corner, that is uh, uh, aspergillum. This is it's a fungus, fungal infection, which originates in uh, the unwashed hands of someone with tuberculosis. Uh, and they actually infected the manuscript uh, with it. Uh, uh, so as you can see, we were able to, uh, we're able to uh, see an enormous amount. I'm in the process of uh, transcribing the manuscript and creating the first edition of it in uh, 250 years. It's absolutely transformative, and it's a fascinating project, but only one of uh, the kinds of things that can be done with uh, this technology. Uh, what, uh, what's important to understand is that the technology is only one small element <laughs> of a larger project. It's one thing to stand here and talk and, and wow, you, wow you some, with some pretty pictures, or ugly pictures as they were. It actually kind of reminds me of ripe Stilton. <laughs> but... Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's a quite a different thing actually to do something about it. Yeah? To complain is one thing, but to change uh, the state of affairs on the ground is, is quite different. And in order to do that, uh, uh, what, what I did was, uh, was decided that I, I needed to found a, uh, an extra university uh, entity, which I called the Lazarus Project, <clears throat> a not-for-profit, which brings together a team of imaging scientists uh, and uh, uh, lead scholars on many of the projects, and, uh, and students. And we, uh, uh, we travel to collections around the world uh, and do imaging, and we do it for free or for as little money as possible. Many of the most uh, damaged and most vulnerable objects, as with Timbuktu, uh, you know, these are institutions that, that do not have the money uh, to, have, uh, to, have, you know, to, to afford this kind of uh, technology. So the, the founding of that, uh, the founding of that, uh, the Lazarus Project, has been, uh, for me, a really transformative uh, opportunity to work with colleagues from other universities, uh, and, um, uh, and I hope to uh, involve people in a larger team. This team, for example, here, involves students, but it also involves, uh, in, in the front row, uh, uh, Ira Rabin uh, from uh, Berlin. She's the, from the Bundesanstalt für Materialforschung in Berlin. Uh, she's an expert in XRF. Uh, right behind her is Roger Easton, who is a professor of imaging scientist and my colleague on the Lazarus Project, uh, and then a bunch of my students. Uh, uh, then on the right-hand side, uh, there is uh, Michael Phelps, who runs the Early Manuscripts Electronic Library. He's the one who, uh, we collaborate closely with him, he's the one who, who is in charge of the, uh, the extremely important Sinai, uh, St. Catherine's, uh, Sinai project, the manuscripts at, uh, at St. Catharines in the Sinai, which of course, even now, right now, are in even greater jeopardy uh, uh, with, from, from ISIL. And behind him is uh, Ken Boydston, who is the father of digital photography. He took the first megapixel picture, and he uh, makes uh, the cameras and uh, some of the lights for, for our project. Uh, all right, well, uh, what a, uh, wh what's really important is uh, to understand is uh, how this technology can transform, uh, transform the way we think about not just uh, manuscripts, but a variety of objects on which, which have writing. Here is the, I want to give you some greater detail on the, the Martellus map. Here's what it actually looks like. It, it, it looks like a large Sahara desert. Uh, we have uh, Africa on the, uh, on the left-hand side with this strange foot, uh, uh, footprint and a large heel. Um, uh, it was suspected it was acquired by the Van Heel Library in the early 60s, and uh, they'd done some uh, ultraviolet photography on it, and they saw some, a few things, and they suspected there was more there. Uh, and it took a while for uh, Chet Van Duzer, who is our, our main cartographer in the Lazarus Project, to convince them uh, to let us have a go. 
And uh, we did two summers ago, and it was a, a brilliant project because this is an object not made up of, of really ink. It's made up, made up of pigments. It's much closer to a, an object, uh, a manuscript written in, in colored pigments and offers some interesting, uh, interesting opportunities for sketch spectral imaging. Uh, <clears throat> the main uh, text block here, uh, legend, was entirely invisible, uh, almost entirely invisible in, in ultraviolet light, also uh, invisible under, uh, under UV or largely. A multispectral imaging brought out everything. Um, uh, here is uh, uh, an image from Northern Asia, and you can see that various processing techniques, and this is important, various processing techniques will react with the pigments differently so that uh, you can process the same tile. We, we, we image this in 55 different tiles. Uh, uh, that the same, the same uh, tile can uh, be imaged in five, six different ways, and each will produce uh, different readings, and sometimes radically different readings, of, uh, of uh, passages. Uh, and something that I must confess, we do not understand why the process, statistical processing, uh, interacts with, this, uh, uh, with, with the pigments in the way they do. It's the beginning, uh, I think, of a, of a larger research question. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, Yes, here we go. Uh, these are these are some some of the uh, inspired by Marco Polo's travels. Some of the uh, not, not all from Marco Polo. Uh, some of the uh, uh, texts we were able to read. We're also able to interestingly uh, <coughs> recognize that um, uh, there was uh, real information from uh, internal uh, from on the ground in in the uh, inner parts of Africa much earlier than people had known, uh, and there that are evident in, on this map. So. Uh, uh, what about the future? We've, our, our present, uh, I think, is well defined by a technology which is emerging, uh, and uh, uh, you know, a research research projects like the Lazarus Project, like uh, the Early Manuscript Electronic Library, which are starting to do this work. But the the vast, the, the enormousness of the challenge is something that goes beyond any individual organization, and I think the solution has to be uh, education to develop a, a curriculum for the humanities, which will train students in, uh, in various disciplines in the humanities uh, to be able to do these projects uh, on their own. Uh, you know, I, I've talked to my graduate students, and many of them are doing this now. Uh, how much better is it <laughs> to work uh, for, your, uh, for your thesis, your dissertation, on, on an object, an important object uh, or manuscript, which uh, has never been read before, important but illegible in the past? You become instantly the world's expert on it. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, none of these secondary sources, you are it. There are thousands of these objects which are going to change the canon, and already have, in fact, the Ache among them, but uh, the Archimedes, obviously, among them. But in order to translate that into real gains, not the ones that, that, uh, that we can talk about behind the podium, but into t real gains, we need to teach uh, these skills, uh, which I call textual science, the traditional skills of, uh, of uh, uh, of the philologist, um, uh, beyond language, codicology, uh, paleography, bibliography, uh, but then uh, what I call forensic codicology, um, uh, uh, or and forensic uh, paleography, uh, uh, techniques which t uh, have a, a which use imaging science, conservation science, material science to extend our ability to understand the provenance, the story, uh, uh, and make legible these these objects. Um, I've developed this curriculum uh, both at the undergraduate level and uh, at the graduate level, and I teach them. Uh, I teach a, a course at the undergraduate level in Honors College at the University of Mississippi called Image, Text, and Technology. And uh, I, I start. What I've done was I, I've created labs, uh, one-credit labs, which teach a practicum basically uh, how to uh, do a forensic uh, paleography, for example, or imaging science uh, for cultural heritage. Uh, and the students uh, who develop these, uh, these abilities uh, then travel with me on projects around the world uh, and use the research uh, for their own uh, senior theses, graduate students for their, uh, for their master's thesis and uh, theses and, and dissertations. Uh, and uh, you develop, at the same time, uh, students who have uh, uh, interesting, really fascinating uh, uh, specialties but also skills which are broadly available and applicable, uh, not just to academia, but to the world's, uh, world of uh, library science, uh, museums. And uh, uh, one, one, I think my favorite story is of a, a freshman a few years ago uh, whom I had. And 
uh, he was imaging in one of the labs, he was imaging a, <coughs> a manuscript uh, uh, which we'd imaged at uh, the Vatican. And it was a palimpsest. And as he worked, and he, he happened to actually have a background, he had a Jesuit upbringing, uh, a background, even though he's a computer scientist, in, uh, 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 in Latin and Greek. And as he was imaging, uh, suddenly this, this undertext started to come up. Uh, and he, uh, uh, suddenly people clustered around and he started to read. And uh, he read a line from a lost work of Menander that no one else had spoken. Those words had not been spoken in over a thousand years. And it was that moment, that moment, that he became a scholar. And this, I think, is the future of the past. I'll leave you with this image. Thank you very much.